I'm Cress's CEO, Todd Wicker. I'm Craig Van Pelt, Head of Research. We're cutting through the chaos to shed light on how businesses of all sizes can create opportunity despite the very real and changing market conditions we're seeing in today's business environment. Let's get started. This is Opportunity Space. Welcome to Opportunity Space. This episode is an exciting one. This one, lost in space. This is a big, big topic in our world, right? Right now, we find ourselves lost in a tremendous amount of available office space, right? We know a lot of it has to do with change of use. And today, we're going to unravel the why behind the shift in the use, shift how people are using office, and explore what it means to the future of work. I'm super thrilled today to be speaking with Nick Bloom, a Stanford economist who's been studying remote work for over two decades and has some great, great insights. But first, Craig, fill us in on some statistics and get us started on where we start from. Yeah, you, you know, this really is an interesting time in the landscape what's going on. There are a lot of paradoxes. Uh, we're witnessing a surge in office occupying jobs. In fact, we've seen uh, 1.2 million added jobs since the pre-pandemic peak for in particular for knowledge worker jobs. Yet at the same time, office vacancy rates are really, really jumping right now. And we're in the midst of uh, this really weird economic scenario where demand is dipped, but the workforce is growing. And the office market you know, has shed about 200 million square feet of occupied space while simultaneously adding another 127 million square feet of sublease space. So that is a lot of additional space going on the market at the same time where jobs are being added. So, you know, at some point, where, where do these things come together and where do we level out? So that's, we're really excited to talk with, to Nick today. About. Fantastic time in the industry, challenging, but, but loads of opportunity as well. So welcome, Nick. Um, you have a lot of expertise in this area. You've developed a real data, data insight view on work styles, the nature of work and what's happening. You know, give us an intro. How did you get hooked on this? Give us your background and then, and then start filling in how you look at the, the world of work. So thanks very much. You know, well, we've been, uh, Cressa and I have been, we've been nerdily talking about office data for a while now, so it's fantastic to be here. Um, so I got interested because I'm actually one of four kids and both my parents work full time. And I mean, I'm 50 now, so I was growing up in the 80s. And back then they would sometimes work from home and it was just horrible. When I talk to them now, they're like, there are no computers. I mean, imagine what it was like. It was carrying pieces of paper, just dreadful. And, you know, we've seen computers came along and then the Internet and then cloud and video calls, etc., and work from home was rising. It was doubling every 15 years, but just from such a low level that no one really noticed it. And then the pandemic happened and it looked like the pandemic has kicked it up 5x, which is almost 50 years of additional growth. So it's just been, you know, it's like one of those rocket boosters where your body's thrown to the floor, where right? it's propelled up. And then it, it stuck. So the amazing thing is now, you know, 2023 was the great leveling off. So work from home was falling. 2020, 21, 22 is the pandemic waned, but it's flat and it looks like it will be flat for a while. So we are now in the new normal. It's a perfect time to take stock actually of what that new normal is for office demand for firms. You know, I'll stop there, but that's how kind of I got interested in this. So, so you talk about in your work, um, three major work styles, obviously, obviously work from home. So I'd love to hear more about, you know, where does work from home fit, but then also dedicated and hybrid. Just give us an overview of the types and then dive in and, and explain it from, from your point of view. Sure. The biggest, easiest split really is the three groups. One is about 60% of people have to come into work every day. They actually mostly don't live in offices. They mostly are work in factories, shops, schools, hospitals, etc. That's the biggest group. Then the remaining 40% are mostly, at least pre-pandemic office based. So of the remaining 40%, 30% are hybrid. So that's probably most people listening, actually. That's managers, professionals. You know, I teach at Stanford. Most of my students fall into that MBA success. They are mostly hybrid, typically working in an office when they're in work and then typically at home, actually, when they're not. And then there's a final 10% that are what's called fully remote, um, where they work mostly at home. That is a segment, actually, that's probably going to see the most flux in the long run because eventually so they're at some threat, actually, of offshoring an AI. 
But for the office world, hybrid is really the big one to focus on. That is pretty stable now at 30%. And just to put numbers on it, there are almost 200 million Americans working just under. So 30% of that is about 60 million Americans are hybrid, as in typically they're coming into the office three days a week working from home. And so, you know, you hit on something really interesting. Let me go back to it. Remote work, right? There are many, many more positions that can be remote and a whole category of those that frankly probably should be, right? In, in, when, I think, when I look at what our clients are doing, when I look at what we're doing, there are some jobs that are just done as well, if not better, remotely, right? And that's it. But you just brought up something interesting. You said they're at risk. Tell us about that. Yeah, so one, you know, we're, we've been talking offline, but I just restate to here that we know that Class A nice office space has tended to do pretty well, and nasty office space hasn't. It's also worth thinking about that, oddly, on an office-by-office office basis. So I used to work at McKinsey in the finance industry in the UK and various, you know, I've had a pre-academic kind of commercial working life. And I remember in all of those offices, you'd have basically the high paid folks at the offices tended to be around the edges with the windows and, you know, nice. And then the folks that were medium and lower paid, often support staff, think IT support, payroll, you know, some basic HR functions, call centers with data would be in the center. Now those center activities are increasingly going fully remote because if you're doing data entry, you know, you don't need to be in the office. And some execs say rightfully, well, they're a bit more productive in the office. That may be true. Let's assume they're 10% less productive when they're remote. The issue is they may be 40, 50% cheaper because you don't have to pay for their office space. And also you can hire them in a low cost place in the US or maybe, you know, internationally. So that means thinking about offices going ahead. It's not just class A offices. It's kind of class A space within class A offices that's particularly important. And those central parts of offices with no windows, I don't know who's going to be sitting in them as much going forwards. And I kind of repurposed them maybe to amenities, a little bit more gym space, maybe larger space. I don't, I mean, I, I'll throw it back to you, but actually it's interesting. Even, even in a very nice office, it's less clear who's going to use the, you know, the, the central parts of it, which also changes the types of buildings, taller, skinny ones, rather than big, massive square foot floor print. Let's come, let's come back to that, but let me ask you this. So on the hybrid in your work, um, you've done some real thought about what hybrid means and how many days a week that means. Um, fill us in on that because that has real ramifications for net use of office space. Obviously, anybody can come in anytime they want. We can shed some space. But what have you found in terms of, of what hybrid really means? Great. So I'll give you some rules of thumb. There's, you know, some of this has more science, some, some has less science around it. So I think on the more science, you know, I have a paper that, you know, is going through with journals and it's well known by now about showing that hybrid, if you're coming in three days a week and it's well organized, so everyone in the team is coming in on the same three days. So in this case, it was Monday, Tuesday and Thursday. It looks like productivity is about flat. So we took 1,600 graduates. So these are people who are in, in kind of IT coding, uh, finance, marketing, you know, classic office activities graduates. A third were postgrads, had masters or PhDs, so these very high end. We randomized by even on odd birthdays, whether they work from home on Wednesday, Friday. So what you found is, first off, like no effect on performance, totally none. No effect on promotions, lines of code written, performance reviews, tax, nothing. And when you interview them, they say, you know, two days a week at home, there's some ups and downsides, you know, it's, it's quieter, I have less commutes, so I'm more energized. On the other hand, there's less face-to-face -face time. It nets out to zero. The thing we did find is quit rates were down by about a third. So my read of this is probably three days a week is enough connectivity if it's well organized to get people into the office. So that, to me, when I talk to companies, the typical style, the kind of vanilla is going to be something like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, people come into the office, Monday, Friday, they work from home. One implication is, you know, if you're in office real estate, in some ways it's quite a good implication that you probably aren't seeing a massive reduction in space. Now, you can say, I often get, you know, execs, particularly CEOs, they're kind of angry with their real estate folks saying, look, why can't we reduce space by having people come in in different days? The problem is just think about the organization of a typical company. It does, you know, there are some real problems about saying, okay, team A, you come in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Team B, you come in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Team C, et cetera. So what are the problems of that? One is 
in most organizations, jobs don't naturally fall into teams. There's matrices and people work cross teams. And, you know, there's a reason the company exists because people work together. If you were just silo teams, you'd have lots of, you know, subcontractors. So that's problem one. Problem two is clean desks. You actually have to clean your desk totally, take off pictures, everything else, clean the drawers out. That's never that popular. Problem three is somebody has to have Friday. And, you know, Friday is the day that everyone really wants to work from home. And one company said, well, we, we, we thought we figured it out because we, we rotated every six months. So if you got Friday, you get six months on and six months off. After the first rotation, it was chaos because all these people said, you know, you've totally messed up my childcare. I, you know, how can I deal with this? So it turns out, at least for now, the easiest solution is really just to say the three days are the same for everyone. To point out that isn't that radical, because if you think back to 2019, we typically work 40 to 50 hours a week in the office. There are actually 168 hours in the week, but everyone just combined, you know, coordinated on Monday, Friday, nine to five. So even pre-pandemic, you could have said three shifts, one weekdays day, one weekdays night, one weekend. But yeah, I've never heard of a company doing that outside really manufacturing. So it looks like I think the future is actually not a massive reduction in space, a limited reduction in space, because hybrid is concentrating on the same days. To the extent space has been reduced, some of it's from firms just going fully remote, and some is what we talked about a little bit earlier, those support functions, typically in the windowless office places in the center of gone. So I could see the future of the office is maybe you know, 15% smaller. You stripped out the central nasty or less nice offices with no windows, but the window type offices around the edges and higher quality stuff, kind of the space is almost the same. Yeah, so, so I can um, support that. What we see is same day, doesn't have a net huge reduction in its in itself, but the type of space you need is different, which is what you're saying. You know, you need spaces that are much more drop-in friendly, much more meeting friendly, free address, not dedicated. So it's not as simple as, well, let me just give back, you know, 15% of my floor space and keep the design the same way. You really have to refit it to, to the more contemporary style, which is much more about convening. So it has implications for, you know, the, the installed office space, because it really does need to be reworked. It needs to be reworked to the kind of space that can handle effective hybriding. And we're seeing that, you know, we're seeing that where, you know, maybe, maybe my space is smaller, but I have to rework it for folks. The other thing is an example is, or, or a ramification is you need to have the kind of multi-generational and multi-level people together in the office. And so you may have some groups that want to be in the office. Others are maybe not as much, but the organization needs to be in. And that is where the organizations, we haven't seen a ton of effectiveness saying everybody's just got to be in because I'm the CEO and it's five days, you have to be there. But we have said you have to be in three days a week because we need you there. We need you mentoring. And you have some interesting insights onto younger folks and how they look at officing when they look at, uh, at new positions. Yeah, you're exactly right. So the biggest challenge is actually normally middle managers. So just to look at the demographic data, if you, I mean, we've surveyed and we have various different data sets, you see pretty robustly people in their 20s actually typically want to come in three, four days a week. So I have lots of students at Stanford, you know, my oldest daughter's 20. I see this very upfront, you know, and personal. They say, look, I want to be mentored. I want my career to succeed. So I, that, you know, typically best done mostly in person. I want to be social. Uh, I don't want to be stuck at home all day. And finally, they're, you know, these folks are sharing apartments. It's like five of them in an apartment in New York. Uh, no one wants to work from home in their bedroom. So where are you going to go? I mean, it just turns out the office is a better place. So people in their 20s, they want to work from home Friday, maybe one other day. The issue is often, and people 50 plus often are in that situation too, because, you know, they, they want to turn, return to the office. It's 30s and 40s with young kids moved a bit further out. And the challenge is, if you look at 20-year-olds, who are they getting mentored by? They're getting mentored by typically their managers who are 30 to 40s. And so, yes, there is a bit of a chance. And I talked to, you know, like I talked to a law firm earlier in the week. It was so classic. They said all the associates are at the entry level. They're young and hungry. They want to come in. They want to get mentored and learn off the partners. It's the partners that actually are saying, look, I've been doing this job for 15, 20 years. I don't need to come in anymore. I can deal with the clients just coming in one day a week and going to client offices. And the managing partner was saying, well, no, because your job is not just winning business and, you know, doing 
providing legal services is also training the next generation. And so one thought is on mandates, which I probably, if you're aiming at three, would be, you know, moving towards like, not mandates, not extreme, but kind of the same way you'd monitor 2019 attendance. The other thing is, if it's an issue, include mentoring and what in McKinsey world used to be called, I think, you know, developing talent into appraisals. So Todd, if you're, you know, my manager, and I have that as one of my four objectives, I'm going to pay much more attention to coming in. You know, if Craig is, uh, I don't know, if Craig's working for me, I'm aware that he's going to be much more positive if I sit down and have lunch with him once a month and see him, you know, on, on in-person day. So that is the other way around. It's really fix the ultimate issue rather than mandate attendance. That, that's a great point. You're right. That is because that that is that's what's needed, right? It's needed in the evolution of in the life cycle of every company. Let me ask you this. Um, during the pandemic, many people physically relocated, right? Driven by housing prices or lifestyle or elder or child care. Just how pervasive were those trends? And and how, do you think that persists or, or, or how does that factor into everything? Yes, it looks like. Quite surprisingly, it's persistent. So I'm going to throw them back to March 2020. We are all sent home. And I, like everyone else, I assume, thought it was going to be temporary. In fact, I canceled my I had two classes in Stanford I was teaching. Both of them, I canceled them and said, I sent them an email. You know, I kind of, this is such a classic email. It said, um, I'm not going to do Zoom teaching. I'd rather do it in person. So when the lockdown ends in two weeks, I'll see you back again. And, you know, why was I so wrong? I mean, it took, you know, two years in that class, you know, unfortunately, they missed the last two weeks. I had to make it up, you know, years later and just apologize. So what happened is Americans in their millions, or maybe about a million, actually, totally, we have very good data from U.S., but the United States Postal Service moved out of city centers to suburbs. They didn't go to, you know, Hawaii mostly. They mostly went to the suburbs of the same big city. So almost 60 percent stayed within the same metro, just moved out. And the reason's kind of obvious, you've got to come into the office two, three days a week. You're still going to be close. You just don't have to be that close. The big question is, would that stick? And much like working from home, it looks like, yes. I mean, astoundingly, it has stuck. Um, I mean, another way to look at it is yesterday, I was up in Gusto, uh, who do a lot of payroll. And they have incredible payroll data. You can look at the distance of where somebody lives to where they work. And the payroll data is very accurate on this. And you see Americans have roughly doubled the distance they are from their workplace between 2020 and 2023. It, it, it's stuck. It's now stable. So we call it the donut effect. It affects many things. So it affects residential. So suburbs have clearly seen valuations and rents go up fast in city centers. You see that in Zillow data, particularly in big cities. It affects retail uh, because there's more retail expenditure in the suburbs, including leisure. So things like gyms in the suburbs are doing well. Gyms in the city centers are struggling. And it also, in a way, affects office space a bit less. But some office space demand is pushed out to suburbs. Mostly what I hear is companies are still saying, look, we want the HQ in the city center because when people come in. But some of them are actually even moving the HQs out to some of the more suburban locations. And yes, that is pun. It's, it's totally permanent as of end of 2023. It's permanent and it really does feed into hybrid, right? Because if you're twice as far out, you know, three days a week is going to be more attractive than four or five. Let me ask you this. You've looked at the economic value of flexibility and what, what have you found there in terms of pay versus flexibility? Yeah, so this is why hybrid has become so dominant. You know, the bottom line is it's profitable for firms. We're in a capitalist economy. I'm an economist. I believe in making profits. Probably like everyone listening, I have you know, a pension and everything. I want companies to make profit. So why is hybrid so successful? Point one, productivity is about flat, it seems, on average. So there's no downside. Then why on earth would you do it? The upside is exactly as you talked about, recruitment and retention. So the two best numbers, one is... We've surveyed tens of thousands of Americans. They value it about the same as an 8% pay increase. So we asked them, how would you value working from home two to three days a week? It's a two-part question, but the average about 8%. So is that a lot or a little? I mean, it's pretty material. When I talk to recruiters, they say, look, it used to be pre-pandemic, the big two perks were healthcare plans and pension. Now it's the big three, healthcare, pension, and work from home policy. The other number I have is from the randomized control trial where we randomly offered some employees hybrid and others not. You saw a 33% lower quit rate for those with hybrid. 
So I would say for five, you know, the numbers on cost of quits are high. So typically the valuations, every person that quits, it costs about 50% of their annual salary in terms of recruitment and retention and retraining somebody new. So hybrid is you know, hugely profitable because it effectively means you have to pay people 8% less in order to have the same rate of retention. Well, and, and, and in this time where we have such a war for talent, right, and cost pressure on talent and, and ability to recruit, retain, and engage is huge and on, on the minds of all the C-suites, 8% is huge especially retention. That's a big number, right? That's not a, that's not, um, that's probably one of the strongest reasons for persistence yeah. in my mind. I think, yeah, I, I think it's the big re again, I think it's profitable. So hybrid is profitable. Interestingly, fully remote is profitable for a different reason and certainly not for everyone. So I, you know, I think of like Stanford, my own organization, we have maybe 10% of people fully remote for a certain subset. Think, IT support, call centers, payroll, kind of relatively repetitive uh, tasks, or maybe some individualistic things like writing chunks of code. Fully remote saves you enormous costs because you don't have to pay for office space. And of course, the wage rates are a bit lower. You know, some startups I'm involved in, they're hiring these folks down in Brazil or Argentina, and they're dramatically lower. So yes, it's very much a cost play. The other trick, you know, there's another just kind of fun thing I've heard from a few companies is this fully remote couple of weeks or month. So I don't know if any managers thinking out there. Another thing, if you have a quite a seasonal business, you may have a you know a month, let's say August or you know December, where things are so quiet. Traditionally, people come in, they kind of goof around in the office. You can instead say, look, we're just going to close the office down. We're going to be fully remote. Now, of course, you know that in reality, folks are not going to work you know full hardness during that fully remote month. But on the other hand, they weren't anyway. And it's hugely appealing to a lot of staff. So it's another kind of recruitment and retention tool. You're, you're, think of, you know, you're looking at two companies. One is hybrid. One is hybrid and lets you work remotely for a month. You're like, wow, that's amazing. I could spend, you know, one month a year in Hawaii or my cabin or wherever it is. Um, so that is another thing. It only really makes sense, I think, if you're seasonal um, and you have a quiet month anyway. But it's another thing I'm seeing creeping in. Fascinating. Fascinating. So look, some of the things you pointed to really spell... Uh, long-term effects on cities, right? The donut effect, people move further away, less traffic in cities, right? Maybe three days are stronger. Give us your thoughts on that. So, yeah, I mean, I recently put something out in the Wall Street Journal saying cities, you know, there are losers, just to be clear, the three groups. One is people that own office and retail real estate in the very center of big cities, medium and smaller cities, that's Leo okay. it's very big cities. Think of Washington, D.C., you know, San Francisco, et cetera. Another group are city mayors themselves. So the most extreme is probably San Francisco. It turns out due to a kind of a quirk of American history, American cities are tiny. So I don't know if people realize that, but London is a massive, where I was born is a massive thing. And, you know, Sadiq Khan, his area of London stretches all the way out into things that I would think of the outer edge of the city in you know, an hour and a half commute. San Francisco is only 50 square miles. The airport and Golden Gate Bridge are not actually in San Francisco City. Why it's relevant? Because if you're London breed and you have folks move across the bay, the East Bay or North to Marin, a little bit south to, you know, around the airport, they no longer live in your city and they don't pay tax to you. And so cities are seeing big drops in budget. That's leading them to cut services, you know, think of police, education, et cetera. And that is very problematic for the long run. So that is a challenge. And, you know, it means... Think of New York in the late 70s. U.S. cities need to get costs under control. It's going to be, you know, tough, honestly, very tough negotiation with the unions being more efficient. The private sector is used to this. Every time there's a recession, you know, I used to do cost cutting exercises in McKinsey. They're not popular, but they're necessary. U.S. cities, unfortunately, need to go through that because cutting services, cutting police and education is a pretty terrible long run policy. So I think they need to get more efficient. But it's hard. It's honestly hard. And in fact, if you look at municipal bonds, They've traded at a lot lower rates with far higher credit risk because people are concerned some of these U.S. cities may just default. Yeah, it's interesting. We have a podcast with Richard Florida, uh, an urbanist, on it. Great, great, great podcast. We went deep into it. And there is a re reimagining of cities. And you can look to the great cities uh, uh, around the world to see what the formula is. So uh, tune into that podcast for opportunities. <laughs> hey, Richard is, I'd say Richard is fantastic. I've actually been... 
talking to him a lot recently. I totally agree. He's a big urban supporter. I'm not an anti-urbanist at all. I think we're very aligned. Cities have a fantastic future. It's just, you know, they're like a boxer that's just taken a heavy slug to the face, you know, that will recover. But uh, they're, they're staggering a bit now. Well, they're, they're very homogenous. You know, the CBD as a CBD, you go to many, you know, great older cities, housing and the fabric of life is very intertwined with office and other work. So this idea that we could, you know, in some ways, a CBD is a little bit like the mall. We concentrated everything into one use. And when one use takes a hit, you know, it takes a while to reposition and you realize there's a, there's a diversity in the fabric and makeup of cities that makes them successful. And that's, I think, we anticipate. The, I mean, I saw an interesting day. I've been working a, a bunch with MasterCard, actually, and one of the interesting data trends they're showing is restaurants in the center of big cities are seeing a much greater shift towards spending in evenings rather than lunchtimes. And in fact, it seems very perverse. There's a group of workers that work from home during the day and then in the evening get kind of antsy, want to get out. Sometimes they eat in the suburbs. Sometimes they're going into the city in the evening. So, you know, there are people that are commuting in, they're leaving the suburbs at kind of 5 or 6 p.m. on a Friday, going into the city, eating out, going out, and then coming back again. They're still commuting, but they're not actually commuting for work. And it kind of highlights increasing focus on what I call leisure and consumption in city centers. Not, you know, that's never going to be the dominant activity, but that's gone up. And that's what needs to replace some of the lost activity from office and actually retail that's related to office. Oh, I mean, look at it. Look at the great cities of the world, the big, deep cities, the London, the Paris, the New York. You go in their destinations, right? The, the, the flow into, into town is heavier maybe at night than it is out of town, right? Just because they have so many uh, diverse uses going on. Fantastic attractions. Yeah, this is, this is why I think by the way, good, good policing and dealing with crime is critical. That one thing that's incredibly sensitive to is crime rates. So... That was another issue that happened in the pandemic that, you know, street, street crime has risen a lot. And so this is why coming back to how you to rejuvenate cities, you need to get crime rates down because the other activity, office is sensitive to crime. Evening entertainment is even more sensitive to crime, actually, even than office uses. Excellent point. Talk about how the U.S. compares or how the rest of the world compares to the U.S. What's it like outside the U.S. in work styles, return to work and the topics we're talking about? That, you know, there is strangely a kind of a, 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 a global split. So I, you can probably hear I'm, you know, I'm British or occasionally people confuse it with Australian for the purposes of this podcast. It maybe doesn't matter, actually, because it turns out we've surveyed almost 40 countries around the world. We've also looked at occupancy data. And what you see is English speaking countries. So think of UK, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand have the highest levels of work from home. They are typically about for graduates. This is they're typically maybe one and a half to two days a week. There's then a middle group, which is Europe. Uh, think of, you know, Germany, France, Italy, et cetera, which are more like one. South America for graduates, again, is looking relatively similar. And then Asian countries, you know, South, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, et cetera, are looking more like half a day. Now, we have an ongoing research study, which I'm going to give you the preliminary findings, which is why is this? And there's a bunch of different explanations. One is income doesn't really work because, you know, South Korea and Japan is pretty wealthy and they have low work from home rates. The factors that we we went through a bunch of them, the factors that seem to matter, the most important factor seems to be culture. So the various cross country measures of culture going all the way back to Hofstetter, really around what's called individualism. So the classic concept is some countries like the U.S. tend to want individuals to make their own decisions. So a classic American company is, you know, we'll give you some determination. If you screw up, you're out, or you're going to, you know, have a, a big deduction in your pay. But if you do well, you get rewarded. In more Asian countries, there's more command and control and less self-determination. It looks like that doesn't go as well with work from home. That's one factor. The other couple that we see, less important, but still there, is population density. You, the, if you have dense Asian cities, it's harder because people's apartments aren't as you know, nice to work from home. And the third is length of lockdown. Interestingly, places with very severe long lockdowns had larger permanent shifts to work from home. And I think people just got used to it. So the U.S. is in some ways ground zero for this. It's very individualistic. It has a lot of population, you know, very low population density. And it had pretty long lockdowns, actually. And so it shifted 
to a very high level of work from home, similar to Canada, similar to the UK. So we're, we're seeing the most extreme of this. Yeah, I, you know, I think the US is out ahead. So as you know, I've worked on management for many years. The US leads the world, honestly, in management practices. It had some of the first business schools, you know, World War II onwards, its companies were, you know, global giants, etc. And I think this is another area. My guess is the rest of the world in 20 years is going to catch up with the US. I think what's holding back Europe, particularly Asia, is kind of traditions or this culture that isn't, you know, so well my, kind of match with work from home. Another reason, by the way, for optimism in terms of if you want work from home, you're out in Asia, is government policy. So it's kind of getting off the track a bit, but one of the big issues for Asian countries and Southern European countries is incredibly low fertility rates. So their populations are now entering into a period of very rapid decline and very fast aging. And that's a real, real problem for many reasons. Looks like one of the best solutions to that is encouraging work from home because it makes it easier to bring up kids. So if you're a government in South Korea, they're going to start pushing pretty heavily towards promoting this as a way to increase you know, fertility rates and try and address some of these issues. So my guess is the rest of the world is going to catch up with the US, Canada, UK, rather than the other way around. You know, that, that's a great point because the change from the pandemic through to now is one of the benefits of the flexibility is elder care and child care, right? And you're just closer you're just closer to the family in times when either you want to be or you need to be. Yes, absolutely. One nice study on that looks at the American time use survey and finds that Americans that work from home spend about 40 minutes more a week with their kids, which if you think of all the negatives from the school lockdowns, and as a parent, I've certainly seen this, one of the longer run benefits to you know, reverse some of this is just more time with parents with kids. Fantastic. And all, look, all that feeds into the war for talent, right? I mean, this, at the end of the day, we found in our business, real estate and supporting, especially the office side, it's about enabling, attracting, retaining, engaging and driving productivity of talent. It's not this expense that's there to be, you, you know, controlled as much. It, it is, but it is really about what is it there for? And we, the pandemic exploded the whole thing and now we're putting it back together and it's just fascinating to watch, fascinating to watch. Yeah, I, I mean, the reason to have, I mean, again, why do you have an office altogether? The reason seems to be people are much more creative when they're face to face, not much more, I should say, they are more creative when they spend at least some of the time face to face. There's actually a famous paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that talks about bursting. And it is, it's a great experiment. It takes three groups that are kind of randomly generated. In group one, people are asked, they're given five hours and they're asked to come up with a new product for this, uh, new use of this product. They're all put in the same room for five hours. Group two, they're all sat individually. Group three, same room for an hour, individually for an hour, same room. Turns out group three is the most creative. And the reason is you kind of need some time together to energize and bounce ideas, but you also need some time alone to reflect and think. And so offices and hybrid kind of gets you that. You want some time in together to bounce ideas around, but you also want some quiet time. So that's reason why. I think the other reason we discussed is offices are important for mentoring and learning. So you need to, yeah, it just seems watching what people do, copying them, sitting around them. I was with a company yesterday that was talking about the outbound sales team and said the learning is so much faster in person because I'm on the phone or on Zoom and I just, you know, I'm between calls and I notice what the person to the left or right is doing and how they're successful and I just mimic them. You think about how, you know, how kids learn from their parents is by mimicry and it's the same in terms of learning in the office and you kind of miss that when you're all set at home. Well, great. Well, look, Nick, always a blast to talk to you. Uh, fantastic insights into the subject. Can I, can I ask one question yeah, before please. we go? <laughs> um, you had such a great conversation. But, you know, Nick, we've been talking a, a lot about existing jobs. What are, what are the, what have you seen in terms of new job postings? And is remote work being highlighted within, within um, recruiting? Or is that just you know, all part of the, the current landscape right now. And it's just, I, I'm just curious how that shifted in the last three to four years in terms of just recruiting and is, is that as a, as a benefit for, for people? Yeah, so totally. We were working with Lightcast that have, they scraped just about every job posting online in the US, but the UK, Australia, Canada, and that 
it's about 100 million postings. A year. I mean, it's pretty much every job out there is posted somewhere on the Internet. What you see is the share that mentioned any kind of work from home was about 2% before the pandemic. So it's pretty rare. It's gone up to about 12% now. Interestingly, it took a while to rise. So actual work from home was at its highest in April, May 2020 because of the lockdown. So in April, May 2020, 60% of days were at home because everyone was forced to. But job postings didn't mention that. And I think because early on, employers were like, we're not sure this thing's going to last. Let's not say it in the job posting when the person's in an interview or say it in words. We just don't want to commit to it. By 2023, the actual job posting now mentions, and it's clearly, you know, people see this as permanent, it's a commitment. The other interesting thing is, I mentioned it's about 12% of postings mention it, but we know about 40% of Americans are working from home. So where's this gap coming from? I think the gap is a lot of jobs now take it as given. So when Stanford yeah. hires professors, assistant professors, we were just talking about this internally, it's very normal to allow them to work from home. We just wouldn't sell it. And I call it, you know, I was calling it like what I call the electricity problem. So every job, you use electricity, but I don't think it's ever mentioned in any job posting or every job you're allowed to go to the toilet, but people don't mention it. So in a weird way, it's a kind of symbol of the success that, you know, only 10% roughly mention it, the other 30 don't. And I think it's because because it's just taken for given. Um, but yeah, that, that's where things are. So it has seen about a 5x increase, 6x increase in mentions in job posting, but I think many just don't mention it because it's become standardized. Yeah. It's, it's just part of the lexicon now, right? It's just part of the way we work, right? There are some jobs where doing it either full-time or part-time on your own versus uh, in the office or hybrid is, you know, it's a component of the job. Yeah, look, look. It, it, it's also turned out, by the way, interesting. When you talk to lawyers, one thing for managers is to be careful what you write in your contract is people through the pandemic never paid any attention to place of work. You kind of would typically stipulate Days of work and activities, but place of work turns out some people would state it, some wouldn't. Post pandemic, it turns out that's quite a big deal. So, you know, I, I'm not a lawyer, but certainly in contracts, does it stipulate the place of work? When I looked at my contracts, I never really paid much attention. I mean, I didn't pay much attention to hours because they're nominal for graduate jobs, but uh, days certainly mattered. You know, you would look at days you're supposed to be. In. So, Tom, I was intrigued, you know, with. For you and Craig, what your thoughts are were on peak office. So I've seen this term kicking around. You know, Mark Galbraith, Joel Pollack, and others have talked about we've passed peak office. We're, you know, what do you see in the Cresta data? You know, um, I think you have to look when you look at the total all in country data, it's reasonably slow moving, right? Obviously, new construction starts are, are way down, speculative construction is way, way, way down. Um, there is building, bespoke building for uh, very specific end users, and there is a whole repositioning, a whole rehash of what people have, what they need, where they need it, the type of space. And that's what we're working on all the time. Craig, any insights you have on it? Yeah, so it's new construction is is hampered by a lot of a lot of forces right now. One is demand, of course, other is debt and, and rising interest rates. Uh, but the, the truth is there there really is demand for trophy class A great space that's amenity filled. Those types of properties are doing fairly well and they're holding their rents pretty similar to where they were pre-pandemic. Um, it's really the buildings maybe that are high class B or 15 to 20 years old that don't have the same amenities uh, that are struggling the most. So. It, it depends where how you slice it. There is there is demand for office right now. It's just it needs to fill the exact needs of our of a lot of the office users right now. So you, because they're also what trying to attract and make people want to come to the, to the office and have that experience. We use the term flight to quality a lot, and that's absolutely the case right now. Uh, not only in within a city, but across the country. Right. You've had people to camp to lifestyle cities and choosing lifestyle cities. And our business follows talent. Right. And knowledge worker talent uh, chooses where to live first and the company second and the companies follow. Right. So a lot of our discussions with clients are around where is the talent tomorrow I need? Where's the talent today I need and where should I be? And that changes footprint. And then behind that, there's a real repositioning. Right. And then you put on top of that the cost of capital and there's a real 
sort of wash out of equity in buildings that maybe aren't the most best positioned. And that's going to take a little bit. Um, and then the cycle starts again. Yes, I mean, it's certainly cyclical. So, Craig, out of interest, do you see net construction is positive or negative? I know building is slowed down. I'm guessing conversion and scrappage is rising. I wonder whether it, is, it, it is in certain cities. Uh, the problem with a lot of conversion, I think a lot of what I've heard from people as well, we need affordable housing in downtown, in downtown cities. The problem with that is it is very expensive to convert office space, especially large footprint office space into housing. Um, it's much easier to do it for other uses like hospitality and, and maybe some retail and that type of thing. Um, it will be converted just because we are in a capitalist <laughs> economy and society. And there's a, there's a demand for space downtown. Some of it will probably be torn down, I suppose, but uh, I think it's a little too early to tell what types of uses will be in downtowns for those well, class B and spaces. It, it takes a resetting of the baseline economics of the site, right? And you see that, you can see that in San Francisco, any buildings that have traded are trading for slightly above land value. It takes a, a, a trading down to what the right price point is to then reposition. And that will work through. And that's, that's not months, that's, a, that's in, measured in years. So, Tom, when you mean slightly above land value, you mean in San Francisco, as that was a you know a field with grass on it, they would be trading for about the same price as the current office building. Just, just above that, really, when you look at it, I mean, we see, we see buildings going for two hundred dollars a square foot where they should be twelve hundred a square foot, and that's really because, like anything else, the worst time to sell something is when there's no market, right? So, yeah. buildings that are forced into a sale for whatever reason, most constituents, whether they be lenders or equity will avoid that, right? Because you're just locking in a loss, but that's one of the problems. You just have an illiquid market, right? And things have to, have to, they have to find their core value in the new world, right? Now, and once they are reset to that, then, uh, you know, new things start. Great. Well, we'll have to, we'll have to touch base again in, you know, 18 to 24 months to see where things are, but yeah. I think it's going to be an exciting time for cities in the next five years, but it doesn't start easily, right? This is going to be, this is, this is going to be a couple of years of um, the challenges we're seeing right now. And, but I think long-term you're going to see more vibrant cities, right? I just, I keep going back to New York post nine 11 when a number of us would have written off downtown or written off New York almost altogether. And uh, it did not take that long for it to become a vibrant city based on talent is where talent goes. Right. And that, you still see that and you will. And, and I would, I would add to that. I think this has already happened. And so like Detroit's a good example of this in the seventies and eighties is pretty vibrant downtown. And then there was flight for a variety of reasons from downtown Detroit. And there was a lot of great buildings downtown that took 30 years, honestly, to be, to be built back and to be, recovered and it has and, and if you go downtown detroit today it is a different place than it was 10 years ago that just took time um and demand actually to and detroit to is probably that. the most extreme example you could pick right sure. the other thing we like to talk about is some of these cities uh lifestyle cities today mid-sized cities we would have written off years ago we had right and now the milwaukee's and the boises and forget about nashville and austin just just the high quality of life cities that talent chooses to go there and companies follow that's you know that that is the ingredient that will happen back in main cities again right is talent goes there people go there housing experience destination um, knowledge workers although everything you have explained is a fundamentally lower use level that's what's different here this isn't just a migration talent this is this is or this not economic it's we're using space differently and we're going to use less and we are. So it's going to take longer to net absorb in this cycle because yeah. the tide's gone out a little bit. Fantastic. Great. We have the next five years mapped out already in front of us. Gives us something to talk about. Yeah. But look, Nick, great talking to you. Always fun to, to go deep on the subject. I'd encourage the listeners and the watchers to click on Nick's work in the, uh, in the subtext here and uh, look at what he's done. It's fascinating stuff. Nick, thanks again for joining us, and we'll see everyone on the next podcast of uh, Opportunity Space.
Thank Great. you. Great. Thank, thanks, Todd. Thank, thanks, Thank you.